in Luke chapter 4, getting to know Jesus through the Holy Spirit. We've been doing a series on getting to know Jesus. He's our Savior, He's our God, but how much do we really know Him? So getting to know Jesus, and today getting to know Him through the Holy Spirit. How many of you know what this is? iPhone 1, that's right. A very spiritual man right over there. Okay, now, the way this thing works, if you get a call, this little ringer right here rings. You pick this up, and this is what you hear from. But you can't talk on this. You just hear this, and where do you talk? Well, you've got to get pretty close to talk right there. But this thing actually works. They are getting closer. What, what is this? What? what, what yeah. and, and where do you hear? If you get this upside down, and so you talk here. And, now, are these, are these the source or the receiver? Yes. Yes. If you want to make a call, you go to this and you wind it up. And the operator that you don't know about anymore, the operator comes on and she says, where would you like to call? How many of you remember calling cross country? And you'd hear this, okay, and you get the next operator. Click, 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 you get the next, but it worked. Now, what is this? How many of you remember those with a dial? And some of you still say, dial them up. There is no dial on this. Now, how do these things work? I don't know. I know this, that if you use this or you use that, you're going to talk at this end to somebody else on that end. It's going to go through a copper wire or it's going to go through fiber optics depending on where you live, but it's going to go through some kind of wire. And your voice, now get this, your voice is going to go through the wire or through the light and it's going to come out on the other end and it's going to be recognizable. There is no wire and there is no light to that. How does that work? Well, you're going to talk on this end, and it's going to go through the air. And something on the other end is going to pick that up. Some tower on the other end is going to pick that up and going to ring another one of these. And my voice is going to go through the air. And when it comes down the tower and goes into the other phone, you're going to recognize who it is, and you're going to hear my words. Now, how does that work? It's a miracle. <laughs> I can tell you this, it's a great mystery. Now that's exactly how the Holy Spirit is going to work. Jesus is going to talk to us either from heaven or from this word. And it's going to come to me through the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is going to act like the wire... The Holy Spirit is going to act like the, uh, the light. The Holy Spirit is going to act like the air. And my prayer and Jesus' words are going to go through the Holy Spirit and come to me. Or my words are going to go through the Holy Spirit and come to Christ. Here's how Christ said it. The Holy Spirit is going to intercede for you with groanings too deep for words. So when I speak to God... He's going to take that and put it in the right form and take it to God. And then when Jesus speaks to me from heaven or Jesus speaks to me from this word, it's going to go through the Holy Spirit and he's going to put it in a form that I can understand. So the Holy Spirit is the intermediary between 
heaven and me, between Jesus and my heart, and between me and Jesus. And I'm going to talk to Jesus, and Jesus is going to talk to me, but it's got to go through the, through the Holy Spirit. Now, how does that work? I don't know. It's a great mystery. But I do know that Jesus said that's how it's going to work. So what we're going to study today, getting to know Jesus through the Holy Spirit of God, in Luke chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 16. But I want you to know this, that when Jesus speaks to you, He speaks directly to you. When Jesus speaks to you, He speaks directly to you. To you it doesn't go through me to you it is from Jesus to you it is a direct line and I want you to know this he speaks personally to you very personal when he talks to us it has to do with us he doesn't tell me what he wants you to do he doesn't tell you what he wants me to do he tells me it gets very personal. He knows exactly what I need. And when he talks to me, it's very personal. It's very direct. It's very personal. In chapter 4, starting in verse 16, we're going to look at four things this morning. First thing, so he came to Nazareth. So Jesus came to Nazareth. Now, that's an interesting thing. He's going to come to his hometown. Nazareth is where he grew up. This is his hometown. Everybody knows him. So he comes to Nazareth. Now, I want to get the context of this. I want you to go back with me in chapter 3. Looking with me and starting in verse 21, Jesus is going to be baptized. Now, Jesus had been living in Nazareth. We're going to see this in just a moment. Stick with me. Jesus had been living in Nazareth, and now... Now the time comes for him to go into public ministry. God has called him into his three-year public ministry. And so he's going to receive baptism. Verse 21, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son, and you, I am well pleased. And God is going to talk to Jesus. God the Father is going to talk to Jesus. But look at, look at who's involved here. Here's God the Father, and here's Jesus on earth. And who's in the middle of this? The Holy Spirit. You are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. That's very personal. It's very direct. Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. Then, after he's baptized, chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus is going to go into the wilderness. You know the story. He's going to go out there for how many days? Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. In those days he ate nothing, and afterwards, when they were ended, uh, he became hungry. Now, I want you to turn with me to your right to the book of John, chapter 1. This is John the Apostle. John 1, we're going to start in verse 28. Jesus is out in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted. And when those days are finished, he's going to return. He's going to come back to where he was baptized. In John chapter 1, verse 28, John is at Beth Abara, which is the ford, the house of the ford, where Jericho comes across as the river right there going up to Jerusalem. It's Beth Abara. That's where John is baptized, and that's where Jesus was baptized. In verse 28, these things were done in Beth Abara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. And the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him. Now, it's been 40 days. John doesn't tell about the baptism of Jesus. He just tells about when John sees him after the baptism. John saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, Look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, 
for he was before me. And then it says, and the next day, and on the next day, and on the next day, in four days. And then over in chapter 2, verse 1 of John, and on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And last week is, we, is what we studied, the wedding. So Jesus comes back from the 40 days of being tested and tempted. He comes back to where he was baptized, and he is there for four days, and he calls six apostles. Now, can you remember who they were? We'll start with James. There was James and John, and there was Peter and Andrew, and then there was Philip, and Philip went and found Nathaniel, in whom an Israelite in whom there is no guile, and those six apostles Jesus called, or those disciples he called right then. And in those four days, and John's going to give the first week, in those four days he calls six disciples, and now he's going to head all the way up to Galilee to go to a wedding. Now, here's the part we miss. Go back with me to Luke chapter 4. On the way to the wedding, he stops off to go to church. It's the Sabbath day. Now, Jeannie and I do this too. When we're on vacation, and many of you do too, when we're on vacation, when it gets Sunday, we go to church somewhere. Now, when I was young, the girls hated it. We had four daughters. And when I was young, we would go to church two to three times a morning somewhere because I tried to gather in all of the great preachers that I could hear. So if I was in Dallas, I tried to go to church three different places so I could hear the three great preachers there because I didn't want to miss them because I'm only off, you know, for a couple of sun Sundays. So if we're on vacation and it gets Sunday, we go to church somewhere. Now I'm old and I go once. Jeannie says, oh, it's Sunday, get up. Okay. Okay, in chapter 4, verse 16, he's on his way to the wedding. He stops at his hometown to go to church. Now, this is going to be a very important Bible study. Don't miss this. So he came to Nazareth. Now, I want you to know that after he finishes at Nazareth, while he's there at Nazareth, at his hometown, they're going to try to kill him. And because of this, he's going to leave Nazareth and never, ever, ever go back. He's going to leave Nazareth, and he's going to go to Capernaum, and he's going to make that his headquarters. In fact, in chapter 4, verse 31... In fact, we'll do 30 and 31. In chapter 4, Luke 4, 30 and 31, as they tried to kill him, passing through the midst of them, he went his way, and he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was going to teach them on the Sabbaths, plural. He's going to make that his, his headquarters. Now, you don't have to turn there, but I want you to listen to John, where we just came from. John chapter 2, verse 12, after he leaves Nazareth, he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days, and then they went to the Passover in Jerusalem. But he goes, he leaves his hometown where they tried to kill him. He goes to Capernaum. Now listen, John says that he took his mother and his brothers with him. I never could figure out why his mother and brothers went with him to Capernaum. His brothers were mad at him most of his life. Why would they go to Capernaum? Because they got kicked out of Nazareth. They're going to try to kill Jesus. In just a moment, we're going to study this. They're going to try to kill Jesus. Now, remember, Jesus' mother is at the wedding. So she's not there that day when Jesus goes in to the, on the Sabbath day to talk to them. She's already over at the wedding in John chapter 1. 
But when Jesus leaves Nazareth, he takes his brothers and his mother and his disciples, and they leave never to return again. And they go to Capernaum. Now back in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, And so he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. Do you get the picture? He just stops off here where he'd been brought up. Would you underline it where he'd been brought up? That's going to bring us to point number two. Is not, is not this Joseph's son? Is not this Joseph's son? Now that seems like a really simple statement. But there's something pernicious about this. There's something subtle in this statement. There's something nefarious. There's something evil in this statement. I want you to see what it is. This isn't just a simple statement. In verse 16, where he had been brought up, where he was raised, since he was a little toddler, they came out of Egypt after his birth. They went down to Egypt for a few years until Herod died. Then they came back to Nazareth. And now he's 30 years old. According to the scriptures, he's 30 years old, about 30. He's been there for years where he'd been brought up. And as was what? And as his custom, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. Now, what's his custom? He goes to church. He always goes to church. And what else does he do when he goes to church? He always reads. They would have three readings at the synagogue. One of them would be the law, one of them would be the prophets, and one of them would be the, the wisdom literature. And you'd have three different people read it, Jesus would always stand up to read one of those, one of those three. And as his custom was, every Sunday, he would do that. Go down with me to verse 22. We'll come back and pick up the middle part in just a minute. Verse, verse 22. And so all bore witness to him as, as he stands up to read and as he preaches. All bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth, and they said, It's not this Joseph's son. We're going to need a little help with the Greek language here. The Greek language is going to help the English language a little bit here. Because our English language isn't as complex as the Greek language is, and so we don't really pick up something here that we need to pick up. In verse 22, all bore witness. There, there's your verb, to bear witness. That's a verb. They bore witness to him. And they marveled at the gracious words, the grace that was pouring out of his mouth. These gracious words are words of grace that are pouring out of his mouth. That's a verb. Those two verbs are what's known in the Greek language as imperfect tense. Now, you don't have to remember that. What you do need to know is an imperfect tense means in the past. So as he's reading the scriptures today, this isn't talking about that. This is talking about as his custom was in the past. This is going to be a past tense Greek verb, but it's more than just past tense. It means when he read here, when he read here, when he read here, when he read the Bible here, when he read the Bible here, at each incident, For probably 20 years. And each time they bore witness to him. And each time they marveled at the words that poured out of his mouth. The gracious words. And this, this, these two Greek verbs mean that he'd been doing this for 20 something years. This had been his custom. Is to go to church. And every Sabbath day to stand up to read something in the scriptures and then he would speak. Whatever he read, he would explain it. 
Can you imagine Jesus explaining the scriptures to you? Out of the, can you imagine him preaching to you out of this pulpit for 20 years? Now, you should be some kind of spiritual genius by the time Jesus gets through with you after 20 years of preaching. Don't you think? And that, in verse 22, is the amazing part of this passage. That the English really doesn't pick up. That for all these years, they've been bearing witness to him. Every time he stood up to read and speak and preach, they bore witness to him and marveled at the grace, the words of grace that just proceeded out of his mouth. All those years. Not only that, Mary the mother of Jesus, who was probably the most spiritual lady on earth, lived among them. And so did Jesus. I'm sorry, so did Joseph, his stepfather. Now over in Matthew chapter 13, it's going to talk about this same thing right here. And here's what it's going to say in Matthew 13. Is this not, is this not the carpenter's son? And his mother Mary and his dad Joseph are among us. And then it lists off the names of his brothers. And as Jews go, his two sisters, only they don't name them because they're just women. And they list off all of his family. And they say, isn't this, isn't this the carpenter's son? And here in Luke, Luke tells us, that they said, uh, is not this Joseph's son? Now, let me tell you what Jesus just told them. This is what's so amazing. Verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, don't miss this, and you want to underline the word, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Because how God talks to us, how we get to know Jesus, is going to be through the Spirit. So don't, don't lose that. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me. Now, you know what the word anointed is? Here? Christio, or Christ. This is a Christological, a Christological passage. This is a prophecy about the coming Christ from Isaiah. This is straight out of the book of Isaiah, and this is prophesying about the coming of the anointed one. The, and the word Christ means anointed one. The word Messiah means anointed one. One of them's Hebrew, one of them's Greek, and they both mean the anointed one. And here it says it right here, because he has anointed, he had Christioed me, Christed me, to preach the gospel to the poor, and you know the rest of it, we can read it. He closed the book, he gave it back to the attendant, he sat down, the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, today... This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I'm the Christ. And they said, and they said, is not this Joseph's son? You know what they said? Isn't that the illegitimate kid of Joseph? That's what they said. Now, we don't believe that. But how do you have Jesus come to church for 20 years and really enjoy being at church and really enjoy the messages? They were marveled at the words of grace that you can be saved and you can have your sins forgiven and you can have heaven here on earth and you can have heaven in eternity how can you have that preached to you for 20 to 30 years and miss Jesus? And yet we are doing it in this country all over the place. Now this is going to be an important Bible study. Because they were so dumb. But let's don't focus on them today. Let's focus on the church in this nation. Let's focus on us and just 
come back to us. Now, point number one, so he came to Nazareth. And he's, in, he's leaving his baptismal place. He's starting his public ministry. He's going to the wedding where he does his first miracle in his public ministry. In fact, it's where he does his first miracle, period. And in between, he stops off at his hometown. Our church. Your home. Your hometown. Before he does his first miracle, he's going to give them his first shot. He's, this is the people that he knew. This is the people he grew up with. And before he starts any other public ministry, he's going to come to his hometown and he's going to talk to them first. These are the people he knew. These are his people. So he comes to Nazareth. Now point number two. He tells them, I'm the Christ. Verse 18, you can't miss this. I'm the Christ. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me. Would you underline me in both of those sentences? He underlined me. He's, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and He sent me. And then He sits down, He says, Today, this Scripture has been fulfilled. This is a Christological a Christological passage, and he tells them, I'm the Christ. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Is not this the illegitimate son of Joseph? They had believed a lie for all those years. He was standing in the pulpit, and he was preaching to them, and he was reading the Scripture to them, and he was explaining the Scripture to them, and their hearts burned within them every time he spoke. But they believed a lie that kept them from accepting and knowing Christ. And he was right there with them every single Sabbath day. Now, what is the lie that's keeping us? What is it that we're focused on where we're missing Christ? And you may not have missed Him as the Savior, but you're missing Him in your life. He's talking to you, and you're not hearing Him. He's telling you what He wants you to do, and we're missing it. And what is it that we're focused on that keeps us from hearing Christ? And getting to know Him. We, of all people, should know Jesus better than anybody else on earth. Christians. And so that brings us to point number three. Today, this scripture is fulfilled. He began to say to them, He's starting to preach. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, how do we get to know Christ through the Holy Spirit? How do we get to hear what Christ is saying to us? Okay, Christ is going to talk to us from heaven. Christ is going to talk to us from this Bible. Now, how are we going to hear Him do that? It's going to be through the Holy Spirit. Now, watch this. This is point number three. We're going to go to verse 18. Today, today, right now, today, right now, this scripture is fulfilled in your life. Now, that's interpretation and application. Point number three is going to be interpretation, where as we read the Bible, the Holy Spirit is going to take the words from this passage, and He's going to explain it and teach it to us so that we can understand it. I want you to hold your finger right here. Don't lose this. We're coming right back to it. <gasps> okay. Everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> okay. Turn with me to John. Chapter 14. It's to your right. We'll come right back here. But you don't want to miss this particular passage. In John chapter 14, verse 21. 
Jesus tells us this. If you've got a red-letter Bible, this is in red. This is Jesus talking to me and you. He who has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. You there? Getting to know Jesus. Now look with me in verse 26. That was verse 21. Now look with me in verse 26. You know, that's just my luck. Verse 26 is on two different pages in my Bible. I have trouble when it's on the same page. John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Counselor, the word is paraclete, parakletos, the Comforter, the Counselor, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will do what? He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you, that I said. So when Jesus is going to talk to you, it's going to go through the Holy Spirit, and He's going to put it in an understandable form to you, and you will know that Jesus said it to you, and He's going to teach you all things. Underline all things. He's going to teach you all things and bring to your remembrance. So not only is he going to teach you, but there will be a test, and he'll help you on the test. The Holy Spirit, as we read the Bible, how are we going to understand the Bible? How many books are in the Bible? 66 books. 39 of those are Old Testament. I told my Sunday school class, my college class this morning, I want you to turn to Haggai. And I looked at them, and they looked at me, and nobody knew where Haggai was. We don't know who Haggai is, and we sure don't care what he said. I mean, who's Haggai? Well, Haggai's the old lady that rode the broom, the, the hag. And that's what most children think of when we talk about Haggai. You know, we, we don't know a lot of this stuff. How are we supposed to read this book and, and understand it? Because the Holy Spirit of God, who lives in me and who lives in you, is going to explain this to us and teach us. Now, if you're a very good teacher at all, if you're a very good teacher at all, now there's a good teacher sitting right there. When she taught something... She had to explain it to the kids. Okay, children, this is in English. This is in present tense, not past tense. It's not future tense. It's present tense. And they all went, oh, yeah. Right. So you had to explain present tense. And the Holy Spirit takes this book. As we read this book, we don't understand this book and we have no idea where it fits in and how it works. And the Holy Spirit is going to be our teacher. And when he teaches us, he's going to explain this to us. He's going to explain it in words that we can understand. He's going to get it down on our level. He is our teacher. Now we come to this book with fear and trepidation and trembling. With I don't know the history of this book. I don't know the people in this book. How can I know this book and why should I read this book? Because God is through His Holy Spirit that lives in you, is going to explain it to you. You may have to read it three or four or five times. But if you want to know it, He will teach it to us. He will explain it to us. And He will bring it to our remembrance. And He does that directly and personally to every single person. And as He does that, Jesus speaks to you. Personally and directly. We don't understand how that works. I don't know how this works, but I do know it works. I don't even understand how this works. Jesus is going to speak to some of you, and you're old. Jesus is going to speak to some of you, and you're young. Jesus is going to speak to some of you, and you're middle-aged. <laughs> the kids say, no, that's old too. <laughs> We're the receivers. 
He's the speaker, but the Holy Spirit is going to bring the message. He's the copper wire. He's the light that the message is going to go through. He's out in the air, but he's going to talk to us and explain to us and teach us. And not only that, he's going to call to remembrance. This is interpretation. As you read this book, he's going to tell you what it means. That's pretty cool. Now, how does he do that? I would love to explain that to you from this pulpit. But I cannot. I can't tell you how he does it. I just know that he's God, and he's able to do it, and he does it. Now, lastly, number four, not only interpretation, he's going to make application. Let's read what Jesus read, starting in verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, Christius, Christio, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the, the scroll gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed upon him. Now in verse 21, he began to say to them, he starts to preach, he starts to teach, and he says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is explanation. This is interpretation. I'm the Christ. And so they all bore witness and marveled at But verse 22 is talking about years ago. What's in verse 22 right now? And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Now he's going to make application. Now this gets pretty cool. He said to them, You will, this is future tense, You will surely say, In the future, You're going to surely say this. And he's about to prophesy something to them. He's going to show them that he's the prophet. In the future, you will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Now, he's not talking about him. He's talking about his family here. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. But he hasn't been to Capernaum yet. This is a prophecy of what's going to happen. Verse 24, surely I say to you, no prophet, no, I'm sorry, no proverb, well, no prophet, no prophet, underline it, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Now, the reason he says that is because he just prophesied something to them. He said, there's going to come a day when you tell me, would you do here what you have already done in Capernaum? This is future tense. Will you do here what you've already done in Capernaum? And here's his answer. Now, this is a prophecy. He said, you're gonna, someday you're going to ask me this. And here's what he says. But I tell you truly, surely. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah. This is going to be application. When the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, you know, when it didn't rain? And there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Zidon. In other words, to a Gentile. God didn't hear Israel's prayer. They prayed and prayed and prayed for rain for three years. And it never rained. He wouldn't hear their prayer. And the only person that he was sent to was a Gentile. And he says, verse 27, Many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha. Now, that was in the days of Elijah. Now, here comes Elisha, the next prophet. The prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian, another Gentile. He said, the days are coming when you're going to ask me, would you do some miracle here in, in your hometown that you did in Capernaum? And his answer is, nah. Why do you think they got so angry? 
They got so mad, they're going to try to kill him. Do you think they understood what he was telling them? Oh, yes. This is application. So all those, verse 28, all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. That's point number four. They were filled with wrath. This application, they got it. Did the Holy Spirit teach them what they needed to know? <laughs> Did he explain to them what Jesus was saying to them? Yes, they were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of their city. They kicked him out of their house. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built that they might throw him down the cliff. When I was at Texas Tech, I lived on the third floor of the Bledsoe Hall, which was out on University Street. Our, the windows across the hall looked out on University Street. I was on the third floor. I heard some commotion across the hall in the room next to me. In fact, it was getting really, really loud and cackling and laughing, just insane laughing. And I walked across the hall to see what was going on. It was about 1 in the morning. And all the guys in there were drunk out of their minds. And they had one of their roommates. One of them had him by the legs. The other had him by the arms. And he was laughing like a fiend. The window was open. This is third floor. And they're going, one, two. And I yelled, walked in. I walked in on two. And I yelled, no! And they said, three! And they tossed him right out the window. On the third floor. And then they all looked out the window just laughing their heads off. And this fool, when he went out the window, was laughing. He went out like this. I ran downstairs to see if it killed him. There was a giant bush downstairs under that particular window. They didn't know this. He landed flat. The best way he could have landed in a bush... And, I, you know, it banged him up pretty bad. But he landed on his back so he didn't put his eyes out. And he's laying down there going, <laughs> Fool. That's insanity. That's what they tried to do with Jesus. Drunk on their own sin. Now, how do we get to know Jesus? That's... That's the bad part. Here's the good part. We can know him. In fact, Capernaum accepted him. How do we get to know him? The Holy Spirit, when Jesus speaks to me, is going to put it in words that I can understand. He's going to teach me. And as, as I read this Bible and Jesus speaks to me, the Holy Spirit's going to teach me and put it into words that I understand. He's going to call these things to my remembrance. And as I go through trials and tribulations, as I go through training, as I go through my joys in life, he will recall this stuff to my mind, and I'll make application. So he's going to interpret it to me, and then he's going to apply it to my life where I can know what he's saying to me personally. Did they understand what Jesus was saying to them personally? Yes. What he said to them is, I'm never coming back. I'm taking my mom that you have disrespected. And I'm taking my brothers. I'm taking my ministry and I'm taking my gospel. And you'll never see me again. And he left. Now for heaven's sakes, we never want that to happen to us. But you know what? It is happening to us. It's not that we don't know him as Christ. We do. We know him as Jesus. We know him as the Savior. We know him as God. We know him as God's Son. But we never do take the time to really get to know him. And here's what we say. Because I say it. I really don't have the time right now to read that I've got to go I need to and we never do take the time to sit down 
and listen to what he says and let the Holy Spirit explain it to us. And here's what Jesus said. Be still and know that I am God. Now, we want to be sure throughout this next week and throughout the rest of our lives that we humble ourselves and pray and seek his face. One at a time, as God's people do that, he hears our prayer, forgives our sin, and heals our land. And if we want our nation healed and we want the church to have revival, it starts with you. It starts with me. As every morning we take just a little bit of time, every night we take a little bit of time just to get to know Christ. And when he has a church full of people who know him and what he wants and what he says, it just took 12 to change the world. Would you bow with me? Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for teaching us, leading us, directing us. Blessed be the name of Jesus. You are worthy, Lord, of praise. Glory, honor, majesty, and power. Lord, would you stay our eyes and our hearts on you? And would you help us to be still and know you? You. 